thanks again for, for sticking around and giving us your, your participation this afternoon. You know all the players, so I won't do introductions. We, we are going to take questions from you. There are uh, mics on either aisle here, so if you would um, approach the mic at, at that point, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that uh, in a bit. But there were some things that, we, that, we, uh, that were raised here in the, in the uh, first three portions of the evening that we want to, or the afternoon rather, that we want to pick up. And one was um, Sunil's uh, sort of provocative and interesting statistic about, um, about what's happening to the seeming core audience, the 45 to 64, and a kind of a sharp uh, decline in those numbers. And with both Matthew and Brent here, Matthew from New York and, and Brent from San Francisco orchestras, here to talk about that maybe how they have digested some of that, uh, that those, those numbers, which I'm sure they're intimately <laughs> aware of, and how you think about that and what uh, what ways there are to address that and how the audience may be, may be changing in both their age and behavior. Well, um, <laughs> hi everyone. We've taken it as an article of faith over the years in, orchestra man in the orchestra management biz that if somebody experiences an orchestral concert um, at some point in their life prior to the age of, say, 14 or so, uh, or better yet, they've played a musical <laughs> instrument, hmm. um, that they are then going to disappear from us for, say, a few decades. By that I mean in terms of regular attendance. They might come back for special occasions, but they'll disappear while they go to school, while they're uh, busy getting established in their career, yeah. while they have young families, all those kinds of things. But when they reach that age when suddenly the house is empty and they're looking at their partner, spouse, and they're saying, what are we going to do tonight? <laughs> that the symphony starts to achieve some, <laughs> some um, relevance, some reconnectivity back to their lives, and so they remember that they really enjoyed the symphony at some point in their lives, or again, as I said, yeah. better yet, much better, uh, they played violin uh, or some other instrument as a child, and then that's when they come back. That's been received wisdom. Uh, for many, many years. So when they don't come back from at the age of 45 to 64 or whatever it is, that's when we really get nervous. Or if they do come back, but they don't come back as often. Uh, we used to have them come back 12 times a year or 24 times a year. And now maybe they're coming back six times or four times yeah. or three times. So we, um, to fill this wonderful hall, uh, we have to find more people like them uh, or different types of people to um, fill all these seats. So that's, uh, that's been the received wisdom for a long time. And every, like so many things now, so much have been turned on its head. Yeah. Matthew, I don't know if that's your... Well, I think, that, I think that's absolutely right. I think there has been that, that era of resignation in that sort of middle period of people's lives. And yet I keep coming back in my own mind about um, something I just made a quick reference to earlier and certainly that Elizabeth would have alluded to, which is that people are consuming the product in a different way now. They're, they're, you know, the delivery is, is um, there's so much more possibility now for both the live experience, but you know, uh, capturing the experience and, and consuming it later on demand, which we all know is a trend that's really happening. So part of me says that if they're not coming back, is there a way to deliver the product in such a way that they would come back um, when I think about my own peers, they, they love great music, they love coming in here in the orchestra, but they don't necessarily like the way in which we deliver it over the course of two and a half hours with a 20 minute break, starting at 8 p.m. And those are my peers who are not musically trained, but who really, I think, have an interest of the people we absolutely want in. But, so it's the, the live delivery experience, and then, but also for the people who are raising children and have busy lives, are there ways that we can deliver what we do to them in some way to keep that connection over those years, which will better ensure they do come back to us um, at the appropriate time. Absolutely. <laughs> what do you two make of the seeming decline in that core audience? You've wanted them to come back, not only are they coming back less frequently because the subscription model seems to be, if not, uh, you know, it's still an important part of your business, but less so than it was a, a, a right. decade or two yeah. ago. What, so what, what do you make of the change in behavior? Well, I think, again, we've talked often about the uh, d diminished availability of leisure time and, and this, the complexity of the lives that people are, are, are experiencing right now. And I think Matthew is exactly right, that we have to do a better job of... We, we, we simply shouldn't 
take it as a given that people disappear for a couple of decades. Now, I, I kind of went too extreme. You know, I kind of made the case. We do a lot of family concerts. We have a right. lot of opportunities for sure. kids and so forth. Uh, but I think you're right about the delivery mechanism that uh, we need to experiment more with how this great music is delivered to the audience. And uh, much more context is provided, much more uh, uh, some of the mystery is removed, um, some of the um, times of day, the duration of the concerts, all those kinds of things uh, need, to be, um, need to be experimented with such that uh, those people, uh, say in, uh, in that age group, my age group, um, who aren't coming, give us a try. I was thinking about Davies After Hours, because mm -hmm. I mean, you've ex yeah. been experimenting with some of that already, mm -hmm. with having right. you know, sort of an after party, you know, really maybe more targeting young people, but, yeah. but also young at heart people. Yeah, and um, also community music makers, which has been talked about yeah. to earlier today, is again designed to provide another way in, another door, um, yeah. so that uh, people feel comfortable here. I thought your comparison about the sleep <laughs> The sleepovers at AT&T Park, I didn't even know they did that, but that's, that's fantastic. <laughs> this they've done it at some parks. I think they've done it there. But, but okay, I know well, anyway, it's great. This is... Um, you know, These we, seats we, look sort of comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> did the backs let down? Did the, did, when, did the arms go up? Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I remember when uh, we started the Community Music Makers a few months ago, and um, I went out onto the stage here, and I... Uh, this is for the first choral workshop, and I came out to greet people, and I asked how many of them had, for them, this is their first time on the Davies stage. Well, of course, most of them raised their hands. For many of them, I think the greatest experience for them was partly singing, but singing on this particular space right. really right. Yeah. made the difference. And even more so for the string workshop that we had a few weeks ago and the winds and brass, because so many of our uh, adult amateur musicians, and I use the word amateur advisedly, um, play in horrible acoustical spaces. Yeah. And then to be able to do this here and to realize that, hey, I actually sound pretty good. I can actually hear myself. Mm -hmm. And even more so, I can hear that person sitting across mm -hmm. the stage. It's that connectivity that really matters such that then when they are in our audience sitting out you know, halfway back and they're picking up the communication that is happening, say, from the principal cello to the concert master and so forth, they can hear in their mind's ear, if you will, um, kind of what that experience is like. Um, this is, ladies and gentlemen, a big generational shift, too, more so than I think sometimes we realize, because it wasn't all that long ago that we not only had a fourth wall, that is this wall between the stage and the audience, but we were proud of it, yeah. we being the field the musicians, you know, that this yeah. was, um, there was, there needed to be an elevation between the professional musician and the audience, protected at all costs. I don't think of myself as all that old, but I've been in this field a long time, and I remember talking to a musician on our stage here, uh, and I was talk, trying to persuade him to talk to the audience, or at least greet the audience at some point, and he said no. He said, no, because they have to look at me with a bit of mystery. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's, this um, is a very, very right. important point. So that yeah. wasn't all We're, that long ago, really. Yeah. I think we, we would have to admit that as orchestras, we are culpable um, in having nurtured and fostered uh, an air of, you know, if, whether you want to call it mystery or, you know, God forbid, elitism. Um, we, have, we have fostered that, and yet now we are working to figure out how do we pull back from some of that and actually strip some of those barriers away. Okay. Interestingly enough, I mean, Alan Gilbert sort of referred to it earlier, which is the sort of, is that people still want some of that mystery. So there's, you have to figure out how do we still accommodate that sense of mystery, that sense of elevation, and yet provide enough opportunities to do these sort of participatory, high impact sort of experiences like being on stage with you know, San Francisco symphony musicians or chorus members. That's, that's something those people will take away and that they will never forget. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to do both. We have to... I wonder, I wonder if what they want is mystery or if what they want is magic, in the sense that yeah. part, of, part of what's amazing about watching a great baseball hit or an incredible catch at the warning track or whatever is that 
you can imagine doing it yourself. It, it's not that, the, the feat is incredible, but it's incredible because you can relate to it and you connect to it. And so some, in some ways this connection can strengthen the, really the appreciation of what's amazing about these artists and what, why they can play faster, higher, louder you know, than, than anybody else. And, and really what's incredible about the athleticism. I mean, that's another co connection yeah. with well, baseball. I mean, we have a unique park in a sense, right? Every hall has its own design, its own special flavor and color, just like Candlestick or the Green Monster or whatever. Every park is a little bit different. But, but also, I mean, these are athletes. It's and, you know, we want to get to know them a little bit. And I think the term orchestra has sometimes be, been a kind of barrier. Does it mean the institution? Does it mean the ensemble? You know, the individuals are often lost and the conductor becomes the figurehead. But we don't usually meet the other people. And yeah. technology seems like a great way to... Uh, to get to know the players. And I think, you know, I know from, you know, myself as a musician, mu music student, I was a bassoonist and, you know, I knew every principal player in the United States and I knew who they had trained with and who their teachers were and how they made reads and what kind of tools they used. And, and you know, I, my students now are the same way. You know, they, they know who the all-stars are in their little world. Mm -hmm. We don't celebrate the stars on, on our orchestras very effectively and I think we could. Well, what, what I keep hearing is, as we talk about what technology can do is it, is it can democratize an experience that has been this very uh, historically laden, uh, at least el elitist one, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and this, is, this is great in many ways, but it's also, it is unnatural for, for, for the industry in, in, in other ways. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I would suggest that, you know, Maestro Gilbert making himself available for uh, an interview where he gets all wired up and and and, uh, and and we get to understand from a from a kinesthetic and physical standpoint what it means to conduct that no mystery has been been lost here. If anything, we've given another way in, yeah. right? For uh, for folks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and let me ask a, a, a sort of a that approach that question from the same side. Does democratizing through technology, of you know open the doors or does it in some ways change the way the doors work? <laughs> For example, I mean, what's being much discussed now are, is the success of the Mets HD broadcasts all over the country and now all over the world. They're expanding all over the world. A little less applicable to you mean orchestras. the Mets, the baseball team, or the... the <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, which Mets team? Yes, both, exactly. Uh, I'm just... Okay. Um, Depends where you, have put, had, where you sure, put the apostrophe. I'm not sure how many people are actually <laughs> right, watching right, the Mets. Mets. <laughs> <laughs> but, and, and uh, you know, it's been much written about, is it changing the way that opera audiences see or want to see opera because they get close-ups in a way that you can't from the second balcony or even from, you know, the tenth row of the orchestra? Is it, and, and indeed, there's even questions about whether the Met, and they've been a little bit dicey about this, is whether it has changed the way that they are staging their productions. I mean, the way in which technology can inflect the way we see and indeed the way things get or connect to the audience I mean, we've had a little bit of the LA Phil Live. There's, it, there's a little sort of experience of this in your world. It's probably more of an issue across the street, but I wonder how, how you all would, would, are thinking about that and how it's just changing really some, something very fundamental about audiences and, and, and art. Well, I think it speaks to the power of the art form, too, because I think one, thing is, one of the things that we all struggle with is uh, that there are so many doors into the art form of the orchestral music that we're not sure which doors we should have open at the same time. Mm. Uh, I feel personally that uh, having screens above the uh, audience uh, is a terrific experience, but it is a different experience. Uh, it's not, I'm not make, making a value judgment here, but it is a different experience. It's a little bit like if, um, if I were listening to, say, the Beethoven Third Symphony performed by the symphony, but I was following along in the score. I, I would enjoy it, but it would be a different experience. Um, and so I think sometimes we, we, um, we struggle with, like I said, which doors to have open, which ones will speak to which audience, which ones will, frankly, turn off which audience. We get... Um, uh, we do not have a bashful audience, and we hear from yeah. we hear from people who say that they find various things very distracting, uh, and we have to respect that. And we really do a lot. We have a lot of conversations in this building about who we really are and who we are going to be in the future, and um, and what that all means for the delivery of this art form. But our audience is not monolithic. So I think That's that means that we, uh, it is our job to give as many doors yeah. Uh, yeah. a key 
right? Mm -hmm. And have that key sit in the hand of the, uh, of the consumer as possible. As possible. So there may be, you're absolutely right, there may be some who find the, the, the screen distracting. Uh, with, the, with the opera, we see that you have the choice of the shows you go to where the IMAG or Im image magnification technology is active or not. Um, last night I thought it was fantastic with the Barbary Coast uh, concert, but there might be those for whom that would have been a distraction. Maybe it becomes something that they can curate or not in their own seat. Um, maybe their program notes are something they can read or not in their own seat, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, th I, I think par part of the issue with the, 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 the brand of elitism that, that we've been given is this idea that one will say what your experience will be, rather than our, our saying, here are the different ways you might have this experience. So, so, so just thinking about from a re managing resources kind of view, if you're the owner of, you know, an orchestra, or not owner, but director. Owner uh, works. Owner works. <laughs> <laughs> I, I tend to think lofty. You know. no. uh, would you be, uh, I mean, are, are we at a point where we really are trying all these different doors in the, very much that fashion, like let's give as many variety of options as possible, or do you feel that now in the last few years, some of these have kind of consolidated. Like, do you feel there are a few doors that are definitely tried and true that you want to, other than the obvious, you know, coming to see a performance, that you, I mean, like, has it worked like the family night kind of thing, or, you know, rehearsal, seeing a live rehearsal, or HD, I mean, are there any of these, that, or do you feel they're all equally unknown and equally viable in their own way? I, I'm not sure that we, uh, especially within the orchestral world, have really, found the sweet spot, if you will, when it comes to the visual capture and delivery of what we do. Um, if you look at the, the LA Phil's foray into this, um, if you look at the Berlin Digital Concert Hall, which I'm talking about live delivery or streaming um, of, of, com of concerts, where, where I think there's been more success is actually something you know, that's been heralded here at San Francisco Symphony, which is the, the behind the scenes, the insights behind the music, the, the, the things that help prepare people or help enlighten people further to, to what's, what they're going to experience. And I, I, I sort of feel that that's, that's probably the direction we need to head and however you do that. It might, it might enhance the actual live experience in your seat, which I think is very interesting. And we have, for instance, a digital archive where we have all of Bernstein's scores digitized and you can look at, you know, you can look at a score on an iPad and see his markings of a Mahler symphony. Someday I'd love for <laughs> connecting students or interested people to be sitting in the back of the hall with their iPad following the score, not just any score, Bernstein's own score of a Mahler symphony. Mm. Um, but I, I do believe that the things that will help us most are the things that help drive people into the live experience because that is still the win for us. Mm -hmm. um, with screens, without screens, experiencing music, having a shared experience in the concert hall in the same way that, you know, for Major League Baseball, I was going to ask you, Elizabeth, about that. You know, is that, you know, is television changing baseball in the same way that, you know, we wonder if the media is changing what we do? Um, I still think that the, the, the win is us driving people into the concert hall for that live experience with, with new media. Yeah, we may debate what makes sense to make available in the hall for sure. Uh, and and, and I, do, I do think ultimately it's going to, the, the result, when you say, how are we going to resolve this, it will probably come down to what can we let people control, because people want to yeah. control it. Have what can they control it without me interfering with your experience? Because you might want that absolutely pure experience right. tonight, right? And whatever I'm doing should not interfere with that. I think we'll all agree with that. Um, but I think what we have seen in sport is that by having a ubiquity of the availability of this content, multiple touch points w with it, whether it's with a subscription, you know, subscription to something that lets you know what the latest in, uh, has happened, to being able to watch the entirety mm -hmm. uh, in mobile devices or, or, or in broadcast, that has corresponded with 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 strong attendance. I mean, I don't know that one is the cause of the other, but. I was just thinking, actually, as I sat here right, right now, last year, at least four clubs had milestones of, of their own right. uh, you know, best ever uh, attendance. attendance, including the, the local San Francisco oh, wow. Giants. The same year in which the franchise, which documented their every doing off the field happened. Is there a connection? <laughs> I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna for, a, for a minute suggest that one caused the other, but that, that those multiple points of connection with what the uh, with what media uh, yeah. allows with with, with the sport it, it's a that's one of the things we had to we had to contend with and I think that that performing arts are certainly contending with is this idea that offering multiple media platforms is somehow going to cannibalize yeah. rather than lift the atten the attraction of the live if you give exciting ways in through media. Yeah. You'll want to come in the hall. I think we. I, I think. Yeah, that's yeah. 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 
I, I wanted to pick up one thing you said, so I think is a really important point that even in the live experience, we all do experiencing things in our own way. And I was thinking about baseball. I mean, and, and the Beethoven score. Some people sit there watching the game, keeping score, yeah. Oh, yeah. and that improves yeah. their experience. For me, that would be torturous, yeah. you know. Or <laughs> people who want to listen to the game on the radio while they're at the game. Right. I mean, that's part, of, I mean, we, and we all do this in the hall here, no matter what we're doing. I mean, I sometimes feel guilty when I pick up my program in the middle of the piece and say, I really shouldn't be reading this now, but I kind of forget what happened in the third movement. <laughs> I mean, I kind of forget what the commentator had to say. And sometimes I do it, and by God, it improves my experience. You know, I'm a better listener, even though I'm reading at that moment. I mean, it's sort of a trivial example, but, mm -hmm. but we all do have our own experience, I think, as audience members, and we should, we should feel, you know, that, that that's something that, that both individually and as, as organizations maybe we should embrace. But someone made the point earlier today, and I can't remember who it was, about the role of the, uh, I think Alan said it actually, about the role of the audience member and how, how visceral that feeling yeah. is that's coming back from mm -hmm. the hall. Mm -hmm. And so to that, ex to that, in that way, it's very different from Major League Baseball, at least the ball games that I've been at, where the audience, the crowd is doing practically everything and sometimes they're watching the game, but sometimes they're doing all kinds of other things. You, I cannot stress this strongly enough. The quality of the performance that comes from this stage often depends on the kind of feedback that is coming back from the audience. So you might be reading a program book, and um, people might not be feeling that here necessarily, but we've all been in arts experiences, maybe not only orchestra, where we leave surprisingly uplifted, but it was in part because of what happened on the stage, but also because we felt that we shared an experience with the audience that we were all kind of stunned by, surprised by, and that we all had a role in making happen. And we've done surveys of our audiences over the years, and, and so many people say they come here for uh, a spiritual, a deep experience, and they share it with a room full of 2,500 strangers. Mm -hmm. and that's a very individualized experience, but, but a shared one. So there is that distinction that I think those of us who run orchestras are really, really nervous about losing because then we feel that we have lost the real core, the distinctiveness, the uniqueness of what we're all about. You're in a different business at that point. You're in the... To a certain degree, yes. Yeah, you're in the media business or some other business. Or yeah. something else, yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So what, what do we do here, Elizabeth? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, 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 think, I think we can... Ex we, sh we should not have a narrow notion of what it means to participate in, a, in, in the performance. That's, that's really what it's about. Because yeah. that... What you've just described, that magical moment where wrapped, we all sit here and it's afterwards it's like, wow, we all just experience that. It doesn't happen every night, but when no. it does, it is unparalleled. That can't be the only thing we're, I don't think it should be the only thing we're aspiring to because there will be, and there are other ways to feel like you're participating in, as, an, as an audience member. And, and honestly, if we don't give those to the audience members, I think it, that will be at our peril. Right Today, entertainment experiences generally, and we are one of them. I don't know that we can say that we are something other than them. We are one of them. Entertainment experiences, when you're sitting in the, in the, in the chair of the, of the audience, you don't want to be merely a passenger. You want to be a participant. You want to be able to co-author your meaning of that experience. You want to be able to talk, you know, you want to give feedback about it. Um, and and w insofar as we are facilitating that, we are making them feel like they have a voice in, in, in that experience somehow, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Which is more than bravo and standing at the end. That's almost an invitation for the audience. <laughs> it's really good. It In yeah. fact, let's let's cue up the audience. At this point. What, what better? I didn't mean to. No, no it's, it's good. Well. really good transition. Well, I can I can give a little sense while people are getting ready about what that might result. And the, the intriguing thing for me about Stevens, you know, reminding of these internal spiritual experiences that when you if you can get people to share those internal experiences, there's there's another kind of magic that happens. Yeah. And I've done this with my students. You know, asking them to you know go to a concert and then they have to write a online response within two hours, right? Not not come to class next Tuesday and tell me what you think you remember about it, yeah. but tell me what you thought immediately after. Yeah. And what they write about are things that are very personal. They're not things that are in music history textbooks. They're like, my grandfather took me to hear this piece. 
when I was seven. Mm -hmm. And I, I still remember him holding my hand as we walked, walked across. I thought, you know, I was really scared about it. And they're these incredible, they have nothing to do with Beethoven, they have nothing to do with the symphony, but they're these intensely moving emotional things. And what happens is when one person shares that, then other students in the class say, you know, there was this other part that reminded me of my grandmother. And, she, and it was so, it's totally different, aberrant memory. But there's a whole level of listening that happens in our audiences that we know nothing about, that right. we didn't author, so true. Mm -hmm. and yeah. we don't yeah. sanction, yeah. and therefore it doesn't exist as far as we're concerned. Which right. may have everything to do with Beethoven, finally. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. There's, there's more to it than that, and that is you cannot put a value, or it's very difficult to put a value on the energy and buzz, if you will, during a week in which something special and magical is happening in performance. You feel it in the anticipation leading up, whether it's from the orchestra, you feel it during the first evening's performance, which then translates into the successive nights. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, you know when you have it, you can't always put your finger on exactly what's happening, but in some ways it's the greatest marketing tool um, in a short period of time. It, uh, it, it transcends any sort of amount of, right. forgive me, print media or, mm -hmm. or advertising online that you, you could do, which is that sense of word of mouth, because there are so many ways for people now to Mm -hmm. send that message to one another. It used to be, it happened to be talking on the phone the next day, now there are a hundred different ways for people. So I think the more we can tap into that real-time feedback, um, I'm very interested in this notion, the, the spin room concept, you know, right after a performance, which is that people really get a chance to say what's on their mind about. Yeah. We elicit good, emotion, bad. emotion yeah. as a part of what it is yeah. we do. We're, we're not a carpet cleaner or a carbonated right. beverage, beverage or a car. I mean, they're out there dying to, to leverage social media and that's, that's the challenge yeah. for them. That shouldn't be that shouldn't be up for us, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Let's go to a, a question here. I thank you. I wanted to pass along two questions that have come in through our um, internet for, through our live broadcast. One is from Voxpox live feed. Um, both of these deal with specific th topics that you've talked on talked about about um, audience different ways of, of constructing the live experience. One is what about lowering the stage level of the orchestra? Um, the platform creates a forbidding fortress-like effect. Then from Jeremy Peters, through our live feed, what about, um, what are you doing about emerging audience adult segment concerts that relate to people my age? He didn't say what his age is, but I'm guessing it's below that 45 to 64 that we've been talking about. <laughs> so if you could just explore a little bit more about those two ideas, thank you. Lowering the stage. <laughs> That's the ops I, folks. I'm out of that yeah, one. <laughs> that's, uh, I guess that's a metaphor for kind of removing uh, yeah. the sense that there is some kind of elevation here or some kind mm -hmm. of uh, sacred space or whatever. Uh, I think there's some real practical considerations yeah. to keep in mind. Uh, yeah, because we're in the business of acoustic music, we pay attention to what, how the instruments project and how exactly the musicians are seated here. Uh, it does get to the point, though, of um, how much we really listen with our eyes. Mm. And uh, when Davies was remodeled in 1992, we went from the prairie style of seating where the orchestra was all on the flat to these tiered uh, risers. And the, the result was that uh, a sense from many people out in the hall that um, they were connecting more with individual musicians in the orchestra. It's only logical that that would happen. Um, so, I like the concept, though, about removing the elevation of the stage. How it works practically, of course, is a, is a whole nother. What year did you say it was remodeled? I was curious. Wait, what, sorry? What year was it remodeled? 92. 92. 92, 93. Yeah. yeah. Huge change to the home. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, well, when you all do your, your armory concert, what will be the... Con well, it's really right interesting. There. So, you've obviously got this huge canvas with, with which to work. So, um, the Stockhausen Gruppen, which really is the centerpiece of the performance, has three orchestras. So there are three orchestras sort of equidistant from one another in a sort of triangle shape around the, this huge space and the, all the seating is done then in between. So up on risers and actually Alan will conduct from a single podium in the middle, not, not connected to any of the three orchestras and they're seating in a circle, in circles all around him. And I think I think it's a great idea, it's a great concept, and I think what the question sort of alludes to, are there opportunities to, to put the orchestra in a different configuration? I, the time that I actually have had the chance to hear and witness Stockhausen Gruppen was actually at the proms when they actually had two of the orchestras in the proming area. If you know the Royal Albert Hall, there's this huge open area where people stand during a concert. Well, the orchestras were 
two of the orchestras were right there, and you could, you could get right up next to where they were playing, and people could see their music. And I thought, how fantastic for people to be able to physically witness what, what artists do uh, in close proximity. So I, I think, you know, week in, week out, it's tough to do that in an acoustically designed hall, but are there opportunities for us to present music in a completely different way, and in a way that people can experience it in a much more up-close and sort of impactful way? Mm -hmm. I'd like to hear the question as a meta you know, in the metaphorical sense, right? So how do we take down the... Right. The, the, mm -hmm. the platform and make, make things more accessible. One thing that comes to mind as that question is asked was actually something that I thought was done quite phenomenally with the San Francisco Symphony's Keeping Score project. What comes to mind immediately was a piccolo player being interviewed about a Stravinsky pas passage in either the Rite of Spring or Firebird. I think it was Tchaikovsky 4. Was it Tchaikovsky 4? Okay, I where it's one so. of the most perilous, I, I could have sworn it was Tchaikovsky. In any yeah. event, it, 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 was, it was it's one of the most perilous places in Last music for, uh, for, for the piccolo player. Mm -hmm. And we heard You'll candidly. Hear it tonight. We heard candid. Okay, yes, exactly. yes, that's right. There you go. We hear candidly the, the description of this as being no kind of you know fear in, instilling for all piccolo players. This is what they all have to play when they you know go through their conservatory and, and their audition processes. And by the time we get to that in the program, I'll tell you this this the stage is gone. We're we're in that piccolo player's seat and we're rooting for her as she as she does it. And so I think there's that analogy that we can yeah. we can use yeah. media to, to take the stage away. Yeah. So you know I'm, I'm thinking of some of your research on festivals and just yeah. the way in which an audience member at a festival has more, you know, choices and more opportunities and they, they feel more control over the situation. It seems like there are a lot of parallels to this idea. Yeah, I mean it's really operation. interesting because we we a few years ago we decided, hey, you know, we've been studying arts organizations, as you say, hundreds of reports, maybe not that many, but we've done a lot of reports and they've tended to focus on specific types of arts institutions, whether we're talking about museums as a whole or orchestras or theaters for you know dramas. And we, we thought, okay, let's look at festivals because clearly you know, it's a species of its own. It doesn't really have anyone necessarily looking out for it, and it's all over the country, you know, in all kinds of places. And open-air festivals of various kinds, and we found the majority of them, by the way, uh, were juried and tended to be very, um, you know, I would argue very high-quality things were being brought to the fore in those mm. festivals. Mm. That said, um, yeah, there's a great deal of interactivity. You know, the same things we talk about when we talk about online media, for example, is you know, this, the, the, the choice, the customization, you know, the audience is being able to wander where they will. It's, you know, bring the family, go around everywhere. And, uh, you know, and there's that permeable aspect between uh, the, the artist and the audience because they interact quite often at these festivals and fairs. And, uh, you know, and the other thing is it's like a smorgasbord of, it's like many doors at once, as you say. Um, and, you know, I, I haven't been, haven't had the good fortune to be to a good classical music uh, uh, festival, for example, but I know that they often also have that same, uh, you know, like all many other good festivals have that s strong vibe. Mm -hmm. Susan, could we hear that, that second question again? Sorry to have you sprinting down there, but... but uh... We also just heard over the live feed that the young man who, who, um, ans who, who, um, who asked the question is 32. Okay, um, all right. So he, the question was about, uh, I think, sort of alternative formats. What kinds of concert engagement opportunities are you thinking about for that emerging young adult audience? Well, I think here we have a lesson to learn from what Michael Chilson Thomas is doing with the New World Symphony mm -hmm. and, and the new venue in Miami Beach and two ways. One is multiple stages. Talk about removing the stage. Um, he has the stage there um, for the full orchestra is lower than the seating for the audience. It's very much uh, the audience looking down at the stage. So that's one. The other is that there are multiple stages. So there are small stages up above the other stage. So some pr in some performance air, uh, concerts, there can be a full orchestra playing something and then that will end and then the lighting will go on to another part of the building where there's a small stage where a chamber music group is already set up and playing something else. A totally different type of experience, yeah. Yeah. almost by definition less formal mm -hmm. uh, because you're, you're moving away from one to the other. The other way that hall, that hall is so distinctive is the wall casts yeah. where you can be sitting outside and uh, that really does remove the stage and again gives a totally different entree mm -hmm. into this type of music. What I found so interesting about it was when I was sitting out there on the lawn in a balmy, in a balmy evening in Miami Beach, the, um, the director of the video was, tell was telling me what to watch, was deciding for me what I could watch. Mm -hmm. I suppose it's like the Met broadcast in that way. 
right? right? So sometimes uh, I might have wanted to be seen what the principal bassoon was doing at that particular moment, but I did not have that option mm -hmm. because the, the producer of the video, Wallcast, was deciding what I was going to watch. Great, it's fantastic. It's really a wonderful way to, again, recognize that that is another door that has just opened for us to uh, try and experiment, but it is a different type of experience. Mm -hmm. We have another question, audience question. We have one at the, at the mic here, and we'll take you next. Um, I'm hearing two words from all of you today, populism versus the sacred, and I really sympathize with you trying <laughs> to figure out how to balance those two experiences. Um, as an audience participant here in San Francisco, both at the symphony and at live theater, um, I'm wondering if you have thought in this bringing in of the different experiences, how to educate the audience in reverse about how to participate. Uh, one of my chief gripes are the people that bring the seven-year-old to a, a serious smaller concert and let the child bounce around in, this, in the chairs or the people that lean forward, blocking my view because they think they can hear better by leaning forward. <laughs> so are there things that can be done to educate the audience about audience participation? You don't just mean audience behavior, uh, but also, uh, uh, was I hearing you also about how they can use some of these new doors e in? And etiquette or? or etiquette. It, yeah, okay, all right. Wow, okay. Um, it's, it's, it's a very tricky subject for us, um, to be perfectly honest, because um, if we become too precious about what we do in the concert hall, shushing people, for instance, then you know, people have sometimes, if it's their first time, they have a very negative reaction to that. And I think all of us who've worked in the orchestral business have seen or, or witnessed firsthand um, instances where somebody came to the concert hall, didn't do something that, or did something that they weren't supposed to do, and have probably never come back. So we're sort of, uh, we're a little bit between a rock and a hard place where we, um, we want the ritual, uh, and yet we, the reality is we need people who have not been in the concert hall before, um, and we need them to have some latitude, at least initially, in terms of how they, how they interact and how they, how they sort of behave, if you will. I, I personally never bothered by audiences clapping between movements. I mean, the reality is that that's something we concocted at some point artificially mm -hmm. um, in, the, in the art form. So that, that never bothers me. I know it bothers some people. Of course, there are times when it's more bothersome than others, but uh, I, I don't know that we have an answer for that. I think that um, hopefully we have to work to help the people who are long-standing patrons um, understand that people coming in who are less experienced, that, that's a good thing. And, and I, I would guess that while you're frustrated by some, some of your audience's behaviors from time to time, you want us to be able to bring in new audience as well. Um, and so I, I, I'm not sure how we balance that in the end. It's a, it's a really good question. I wonder if we could approach it also from the positive angle and just re, uh, find a way to tell the audience that the musicians can feel, can sense right. when there's um, undivided Restless. attention coming this direction and just maybe use that as a way to, uh, to encourage certain kinds of uh, etiquette happening. I'll, I always sit there and I've noticed this season that there's um, an audience member sitting over here who has at almost every concert, not all of them, but uh, certainly a lot of them, and he absolutely loves the music and makes no, no, um, no uh, apologies for that. Uh, to the point where he is direct conducting sometimes, <laughs> um, really, really thoroughly energized by the music. I think for some people out here, it could be a distraction. I don't think we've heard from anybody yet that that person is, is distracting, but isn't that great? I mean, really, fundamentally, yeah. isn't that yeah. wonderful? Uh, part of the joys of live performance and some of the frustrations of live for performance is its unpredictability. Yeah. And um, I do find myself sometimes irritated with some audience members' behavior, but we're community. And, yeah. and community etiquette is 
I guess, changing mm -hmm. maybe in some ways. But I think if we should think about finding a positive way to frame it. Yeah. Well, Matthew, you mentioned it and you alluded to it that the convention going etiquette, I mean, the, the convention of etiquette and concerts and how they're conducted is completely in a, a cultural you know, construct. I mean, 200 years ago, people ate, and as Ben Cameron said in his blog post, going to a concert 200 years ago was a very different kind of experience than what it is now. And what's to say that that... Just replace all the lights important. with candles, we'll have some sense of... Yeah. How <laughs> exactly, right. right. But I, I think we should have a program where, you know, long-time audience members bring a friend. You know, at least once a season, they should have some kind of companion ticket or some deal they can get. If I know any people who run orchestras, I'll tell them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we had a question down front here. Can you, could, would, do you mind going to the microphone? Thank you. There's another question. Oh, sorry, while she's going. Yes, let's take yours. Yes, because I'm around here a lot as a volunteer, I've gotten to know quite a number of the orchestra members. I find that really helpful. And I wish there were more opportunities for people to yeah. get acquainted with them. As I am, you know, I know Peter and Amos and Larry. And, um, know what's going on with them. And uh, that really gives me a connection. When I go to New York, for example, I don't know those people. I like them, but I don't know. I can probably arrange an introduction or two. <laughs> <laughs> what was your name again? <laughs> I'll be there next month. <laughs> it's a really good point, yeah. and we have heard that as kind of a recurring theme in these discussions, is that they should be as known and as recognized as the baseball team yeah. uh, members are. What, what, I, what I find fascinating about all this is there's almost, there's a real plurality of interests here. I mean, there's people who want something, I mean, I don't know if everybody would say what she just said, but I think a lot of people would, but then yeah. you know, other people would be with the guy back here <laughs> conducting. You know, I mean, there's, it's almost like putting the research hat on if you could identify these kinds of segments <laughs> and really yeah. target them and you know, just yeah. do what, you know, find ways strategically yeah. through your you know, repertoire. I think there's a cultural issue, I mean, that we, we and it's getting much, much better, is, is helping our musicians and the orchestra understand how important the relationship is between them and the audience. I think sometimes they underestimate how powerful that can be, but I've seen it with my, my wife, for instance, who's not a musician. Once, the, once she started to know people in the orchestra, you know, she'd come back from a concert, Dave had a big solo tonight. You know, she notices things in a way with personal, personal connections now. And I was actually going to ask Elizabeth because um, I saw a story the other night on the news about the demise of the baseball card industry. I was thinking about that. Um, and uh, forgive me for asking, because I'm sure this is probably an obvious answer, but how has is, how is baseball transitioned from the physicality of baseball cards, which kids collected when I was growing up, um, to being able to have people have that? I mean, that was their own connection with individual players, I suspect. That's a great question. Um, I, I, if you think about what the card did back in the analog era of paper assets right. being able to tell us important That's things. as analog as it gets, I think. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, it... it it told you what you know, what what these, what this, this, the stats, the success of this of this uh, individual. It was necessarily limited in it only allowing for one image, and it telling you whatever stats had been compiled of the moment of printing. Fast forward to today, you, you're right. That's a that's a a, a different proposition in, in 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 this era. But I I would argue that the uh, new and improved and and vastly more. Um, dimensionalized version of that is something like the companion second screen offering that MLB at app uh, at MLB app is yeah which you know you could turn on your, your your game or you can go to the to the ballpark and have in your lap something that gives you um, another way in and a whole bunch of stats and information about who you see on the field at that given moment so it's just a dynamic version of the base of the baseball card yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Great. question over here Thank you so much. I uh, would like to just preface this by just saying that uh, not only have I been attending music since I've been a child, but I have been a music teacher, I am a musician, and I have performed, and I've run music programs where I wrote my own material and programmed the music, specializing in 20th century music. And I also am always interacting with students, many of them from other countries, and a great many of them, of course, coming from pop and rock. And I want to bring up something that I have so much to say because of this very, very broad 
experience from my whole life, but there never is the opportunity. This is not the time for it, and I'll just limit myself to two things. One thing that is never really considered, and this, I think, is something very crucial and very, very critical, especially where we are considering trying to maintain and to build an outreach on new audiences where there is a crossover from musical genres. And the very, very first contact that someone will have who has not been brought up in classical music is the box office. And I will say that I'm, I'm a native of San Francisco, and so I've dealt with opera, symphony, ballet all my life, and of course, writing it in as a subscriber. But dealing with the box office, there are many, many young people. When I say young people, I mean people who are under 30. I don't mean just teenagers, who are curious and very, very interested in classical music because they get strains of it as excerpts or as you know adaptations in their pop music. They want to hear the real thing, and they want to hear it here because they know we've got a world-class orchestra. And so they're dealing with trying to buy tickets, and of course they're single tickets. They're not subscribers yet. They may never be. And their first experience is with the box office. The, I, I work with a lot of college people, and so I know this. Uh, and they're not only buying tickets to concerts, to symphony tickets, SF Symphony, not just pop concerts that take place in Davies Hall, but actual symphony concerts. They're also dealing with opera and with ballet. And one thing about our San Francisco Symphony box office, and this has been a trend through many, many years, is that they don't find a graciousness and a warmth and a welcoming tone, especially over the telephone. And many of these people, they, don't, they can't even pronounce the composer's names. Some of them can barely make themselves understood but from their own countries, they have been exposed to classical music. They want to hear it here. And it's very scary for them to buy tickets, especially over the phone. They find that it's bad enough in person at the box office here, but they find it especially so over the telephone. They've told me this, and I myself have noticed it, but I just let it pass because I know how things are. But I think this is something that is very important to address. Their second exposure then, once they have the ticket, is that they come into the hall and they are immediately exposed to and received by the ticket takers and the usher staff. They are wonderful. All the people, despite their tuxedos, the tuxedos don't intimidate these newcomers. They could but they don't because this staff is warm, accommodating, welcoming. They treat you like you're really, really special, even if you've been to this place over and over. You know, they, they recognize me. They know I've been here through all these years, and they still treat me like I'm really special. This matters to those people who are coming in new to classical music, and I, I've wanted to express this for years, and I've never had the opportunity, and I took that chance today because I know that it's risky because I'm not saying flattering things, but this is an important aspect, very important because it is the very, very first face and voice that they are presented with when they try to attempt to cross over the barrier from rock and pop or no music into classical. The other thing that I wanted to say is that, I mean, I, I love what I call the SOB. It's my, it's like blood corpuscles to me. That's symphony, opera, ballet. And I love opera and ballet when it's on the stage, in the house across the street, and when it's on the big screen. And I wonder if there's a possibility. I mean, we did have the LA Phil with Dudamel. Why can't we also have a series of concerts 
that are filmed for a different kind of subscription for people who have grown up with films and with video who want to hear a big sound because they've grown up with rock sound hearing our concerts in the theater and then they can also be transferred into DVDs and sold that way. I come to the symphony and there are certain performances, certain interpretations I want to hear again, over and over again, and I can't. It might be broadcast on KDFC, but once that's it. They might rebroadcast it four years later, but they don't know. Why can't we also have that and build a different kind of audience, which would also, through the side door, bring them into the concert hall? Right. That's. Yeah. Those are the two things. Th I have lots of stuff to say, but I'll limit myself to two. Thank you. Thank you two. for that. Thank you. Brent, she's giving you a big, uh, I guess a so. big, uh, big menu Thank there. You. Thank you. Uh, point taken on the box office, and I will say that uh, we work very, very hard to make sure that our box office staff is, is cordial, friendly, and aware that they're talking to people for many, many, many of whom this is first time experience. Uh, I will say that uh, we. Um, we, uh, uh, I, I'm not disagreeing with your point, but we get regular raves too about the box office staff. But the other thing I was going to say is that so many of the new people who are coming in are now not even talking to people. They're just coming in through the website. So to that extent, the website has got to be extremely friendly, easy to navigate, so that the first timers can click on the sound clips and say, yes, that is the piece that I thought it was, and yes, I am gonna buy a ticket for that. So uh, we can always do better. You're absolutely right. The public face of our, of our um, organizations really, really matters. Um, uh, from the second that you first try and buy your ticket till, the, till you get home after the performance, it's, in t in, it's an entire package. To your second point, uh, yes, the answer is yes. We should and, and wish we could do much, much more. Cost is always an inhibitor. Rights is always an inhibitor. Um, but um, there, uh, we, we would love to make the performances, the music, basically uh, in your lives every step of the way, anybody's lives every step of the way. So keeping score was part of that. We're working on new... Uh, elements of keeping score such that it is more ubiquitous, more available, more easily accessed in smaller chunks. And um, again, there's just so many doors that we can open with using technology. Speaking of the box office, I can't believe we've talked about audience for almost three hours now and haven't talked about what is a huge factor for audience, and that's ticket cost. Uh, baseball talks about dynamic pricing all the time. They're very sensitive when the Dodgers are in, a ticket to the Giants game is more expensive than when the Pirates are here. Uh, how are you all thinking about uh, dynamic pricing and, and like an airline, you'd like to sell every seat if an, even if it meant deeply discounting some of them? How are you, you know, dealing with the audience and on that, to them, very important matter? Do you want, you want to go first? <laughs> um, <then>? Sure. <laughs> uh, look, we, you know, we're, we're an arts organization, we're a not-for-profit, but we have financial pressures and our, part of our charge is to maximize our revenue generation and part of that is through ticket sales. So we, we do from time to time employ dynamic pricing. It's, it's not incredibly commonplace and we certainly don't do it with the spirit of making a performance inaccessible uh, to audiences. We try to respond to the market but also temper that with a desire to make things accessible. What, I, I guess from my own personal feeling, we, we, those are things that we need to do in order to be fiscally responsible and, and live up to the business operation you know, mandate that we have. Having said that, I, I, I think especially on the lower end of things in terms of uh, availability of tickets for young people uh, to core performances, I think there's more sh we should do. I think we should figure out a way to strip price as a barrier out mm -hmm. of the equation as much, mu as much as possible. There should still be a transaction. There should be a, still a sense of value um, from that transaction in, in, in coming to a performance, but uh, it would be great to see uh, our own organization move in some directions to to strip that price barrier away. Um, I I think there's there's lots that we can we can do on that front to be sure. Yeah, I agree, and I think the word value really comes into the equation yeah. here. Um, the the fact. I think many people don't realize that you can come to practically any concert here for $15 um, uh, for various seat yeah. seating sections. So I would suggest that price is perhaps not as much of a barrier as the perception that the it is expensive is 
is a barrier. That's one. And then the other thing is ma many of us have gone to, um, to things that were expensive or that we thought was expensive, uh, but we thought, this is great. This is worth every penny. And then there have been other things that were not so expensive, and it wasn't great, and yeah. we st still felt that it was ripped off. So the question is, yeah. it, does a price value yeah. equation, right. is a price value equation a line? And so many of the things that we've been talking about today are about delivering the value uh, such that price doesn't, is not the issue. Um, so I think that's, uh, your, your, your reference is value really, really, yeah. I yeah. think, hits home. Yeah, great. We've got one question there at the... Yes. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, my perspective, I guess, on, on new audiences is as a, uh, a cello dad. Uh, my daughter, who's 13, is a cellist, and uh, she uh, definitely enjoys going to the orchestra much more because of her participation in music, uh, active participation. She's in a youth symphony. She's had the experience of going to the orchestra and hearing the orchestra. We live in Seattle. It's the Seattle Symphony uh, play pieces that she's played. And, and I know that she's very excited to hear the same music that she worked so hard on performed by professionals and, and the results that they get. Um, she's also a very acute critic of, of the music she hears, and she doesn't always necessarily find the interpretations of conductors that come through to her liking. Um, I remember recently, she actually is fortunate to have a teacher who is in the cello section of the orchestra, and uh, at one of her lessons she said, you know, I really didn't understand the cueing that that guest conductor was giving the orchestra in a performance. And he said, well, you know, I have to tell you, the orchestra didn't either. <laughs> so, uh, but, but the fact is that she, I can tell that she, she really is engaged with, with the uh, performances, and she, I'm sure she'll be a, a lifelong uh, orchestra goer. And you know, perhaps one of the keys to the, the uh, concern that uh, Mr. Arsink brought up recently of, of having young people who participate and who have been coming back in the, in the past when they're older is to encourage them not to put down their instruments. Mm -hmm. Um, Joshua Roman, the cellist, recently posted on his blog a comment that in the past, in the 18th and 19th centuries, orchestras were made up, I mean, uh, audiences were made up much more of people who were amateur musicians themselves. Mm -hmm. And now we have more of a model where we have uh, consumers of classical music who are passively receiving the product of very highly trained professionals. And there's much more of a disconnect, and I think that's part of where that fourth wall comes from. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question for you would be, what would be some of the ways that professional orchestras and other professional arts organizations can encourage amateurism and encourage people to continue playing when they're in college, continue to play in their homes in ch as chamber musicians? That doesn't take much in the way of resources to do. And to engage with these organizations to support their activities. Well, Community Music Makers yeah. is designed exactly for that yeah. type of person. Um, I do find it disturbing when people tell me that they've played a musical instrument through college and then they set it aside. And then, the, you know, a few years later, they don't pick it up again because it is too frustrating, mm -hmm. um, not rewarding anymore. Uh, we all, for those of us who have played musical instruments, we, we found a, probably a part of who we are in the expression of make, making music on that instrument. And then for us to decide that we've reached the age of 22 or 24 or whatever, and uh, something else has crowded that out of our lives, we really shouldn't allow that to happen very easily. And I think you're absolutely right. We as orchestras have a really, really important role to play to demolish some of that um, false dichotomy between professional and amateur. And what's, I think, very optimist, uh, hopeful for our field in the future is that, there, that people are less willing <laughs> to be categorized in that way, too. They want to participate. They, yeah. they want to chart their own course. They want to be musicians themselves. And um, I think uh, we have really tapped into a vein of uh, untapped, uh, of great energy here in, with the Community Music Makers program where we put, a, put an announcement out and it sells out pretty much right away. We have a waiting, we're turning people away. We have a waiting list mm -hmm. and uh, it's something that is tremendously exciting. So thanks for sharing your yeah. story. Hopeful notes are always a great way to end. You have been a great audience today and, and will be going forward. Do we have one last question here? There's one over there. Oh, 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 oh okay. The audience gets the last word always. Okay, it's only fitting. <laughs> is that 
Yes, it's just a comment. My name is Rosa, and I am from Chile, and I have been, I have visited most of the symphony halls around the world, and talking about spirituality and happiness, in all those places I have seen that connection, a wonderful connection, people happy to be there, they understand why they are there, and a wonderful feeling contrary to other huge gatherings. When I go to a soccer game in Brazil, 80,000 people, ah, in that tension, who is going to win? At the end, they leave sad, fighting. <laughs> what about in Spain, the, the bull f uh, fights? An animal has to die. Uh, uh, car racing, people also, oh, terrible things can happen. It's true, at the Coliseum in Rome, you know, uh, people went to, uh, were killed by animals, but the symphony is something that really um, is very positive, and I, I live with that wonderful feeling, peace of mind, and I hope, uh, I, I know that I will continue visiting the main symphony halls like this one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Very quickly to finish us off, please. Yes, you're, you're on. Uh, Elizabeth, uh, perhaps you all are doing something that we all can learn from here in the West. What's going on with Lincoln Center then in your position? It, uh, Lincoln Center has three residents, the opera, the ballet, the symphony. What is your relationship? Do you provide an umbrella service? Are you an example of resource sharing among those three entities to improve their involvement with the media? Can you speak to that? Oh, I, love, I love that question. Uh, there's actually 11 resident organizations on the, on the campus, uh, and Lincoln Center sits at the center of those and, and does facilitate relationships, um, uh, not, not only amongst them, but also centralizes certain activities. A good example of that on a media front is the 36-year running PBS series Live from Lincoln Center, which features more often than not the performances of our resident organizations. Uh, and, and that's a perfect example in my mind for how um, they're being, the investing in one production outfit, if you will, which is the Live from Lincoln Center production out, uh, outfit, can benefit multiple of the, of the organizations on campus. I think your question intimates, might, might there be the possibility for aggregated action amongst those constituents uh, in, support of, um, you know, in, in support of any of the initiatives we might be talking about? And I think the answer is yes. Uh, and uh, a, per a perfect sort of just small example of that is there's a digital infoscape that has r recently been put on the campus as a part of the, um, the significant physical redevelopment of the campus. And the participation of all the, the performing uh, arts organizations on campus contributing to that um, is something that's, that's possible only because it's been aggregated in one space. I think there's that possibility on a media front for distribution, absolutely, and I think it, it could also very well happen beyond the, the campus itself of Lincoln Center. Great. So stay tuned. Great. Great. Thank you. Thank you to the, Thank you. to the panel members and to you very much. Thank you so much.